The Roaring Twenties was a decade of economical, technological, and industrial prosperity in the metropolitan cities of the United States. The Industrial Revolution was still changing how companies operated. The economy was booming due to low-priced goods and fair-paying jobs, and technology was just beginning to change us. However, it took a lot of work for it to get this far. For those living in rural areas of America, life in the early 20th century was still like the 19th century. The main form of communication was by writing letters, and most of the towns and villages had no electricity. People were not able to gain immediate access to the news and entertainment of the country. The turning point came in 1920, when Westinghouse Electric Company and Dr. Frank Conrad established the first radio station, KDKA, and ready-to-use radios went on the market. Radio sales boomed, and hundreds of stations popped up across the country. It became the prime source for entertainment and news for the next four decades, paving the way for television and internet. At the turn of the century, Italian inventor Guillermo Marconi had been testing and experimenting with wireless signals and radiation. In December 1901, he succeeded in sending a radio signal from Newfoundland across the Atlantic Ocean to the UK. This in itself was a turning point, because afterwards, radios were installed on ships and were essential in communications with the Navy during World War I. Frank Conrad, an engineer at Westinghouse Electric Company in the 1910s, was interested in radio. To settle a $5 bet about the accuracy of his watch, he built a radio receiver to hear the time signals from the U.S. Naval Observatory. This was not an unusual fate. At the time, radio receivers could be bought in a kit from a hobby shop or hardware store and assembled by the user. It was fairly straightforward to put together a crystal set. Conrad was interested in sending signals, and after tinkering with his receiver, he turned it into a transmitter. He began making broadcasts from his garage in Pittsburgh, and those with their own self-assembled receivers tuned in. Although the broadcasts were not especially interesting, listeners were excited to hear the wireless transmissions. After a while, Conrad's voice grew tired of constant announcements, so he started playing gramophone records. Soon afterwards, his listeners started requesting specific music for him to play. Conrad was radio's first DJ for his amateur station 8XK. Word got around about Conrad's broadcasts, and the demand for radio sets grew. Horn's department store saw a new market, and they began selling ready-to-use radios in 1920. This meant that people no longer had to spend time putting together a crystal set. They just plugged in the radio and it was ready to go. The new radio sets were on sale for $8 and up. Henry Davis, Conrad's boss at Westinghouse, saw an advertisement in a Pittsburgh newspaper offering these radios for sale for those who want to tune in the Westinghouse station and realized for the first time the impact that Conrad's broadcast had made in the community. With Conrad's consent, he applied for the first commercial radio license and was granted with the call letters KDKA in mid-October 1920. The station's first official broadcast were the results of the Harding Cox presidential election. This is KDKA of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company in East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We shall now broadcast the election returns. <clears throat> the idea of commercial radio led other communication companies to consider it. By 1922, there were 30 radio stations operating in the United States and about 100,000 consumer radios had been sold. Just a year later, 556 stations were operating and half a million sets had been sold. Finally, people everywhere in the United States were able to hear the news and entertainment of the country. The radio was only just beginning to take effect on people's lives. Radio programs were beginning to develop, but the executives needed to figure out an effective way to make money from broadcasting. Most stations were barely making enough to pay employees and keep equipment running, and the money they were making were the profits of radio receiver sets. In 1922, AT&T announced that they would begin selling toll broadcasting to advertisers, in which businesses would finance or underwrite a broadcast in exchange for being mentioned on the radio. 
AT&T's WEAF station in New York is credited with airing the first paid radio commercial. People were able to listen to unlimited radio broadcasts for free because the expenses were paid by business advertising. It took a few years for advertising to catch on, but eventually radio stations realized that this was the only effective way to make money from broadcasting. Now that stations were able to make a steady stream of money, they had to change the broadcasts that they were making. No one had ever devoted themselves to providing hours of daily entertainment. Radio had to provide different entertainment to the same audience every day. It didn't take long for new ideas to hatch. In the early 1920s, KYW Chicago broadcast its musical guessing contests, inviting listeners to send in their guesses about the names of songs performed. KFI Los Angeles had Nick Harris reading detective stories every week. One of the first major radio shows was Amos and Andy, a hybrid of soap opera and folk humor in the 1930s. Freeman Godson and Charles Correll starred as two mishap prone pals participating in schemes and misadventures, and they drew in a large audience who wanted to see what would happen on the next 15 minute episode. This was something new in our country, a shared, common experience that came right into one's living room night after night. Soon afterwards, new radio shows emerged. Dramatizations of current events. The March of Time. Relief from daily chores with the soap opera sagas. And now, for Ma Perkins. Well, at last, is Ma learning the truth about the cousins? Concentrated super suds Now the best loved family on the air, the Goldbergs, brought to you by the makers of Oxygen. After school adventures with. A daily dose of Amos and Andy. Andy, tell me one thing. Is you a Democrat or is you a Republican? Well, I was a Democrat. Mm -hmm. But I believe I have done switched over to the Republicans now. Classical music on weekends with Arturo Toscanini. And of course, regular wartime updates. We interrupt our program to bring you a special broadcast. The German news agency, Transocean, said today in a broadcast that the Allied invasion had begun. There was no Allied confirmation. We return you now to your regularly scheduled program. Radio made this country smaller and smarter. It brought the finest dramatic and musical performers to the farmhouses of Iowa and the Kansas Plains. There was variety and there was choice. It was amazing. And, and what it helped really to do, I think, is bring the world closer and closer together. But nothing lasts forever. In the late 1930s, a new form of communication was developing, television. People would not only be able to listen to entertainment, but they would see it. The phenomenon of television grew more and more popular, and by the early 1950s, it had replaced radio. Radio had to turn back to its roots, music and news, because it was for these that people still listened to radio. Although radio is not as prominent in our lives as television and computers, it still quietly exists to enhance how we communicate, learn, and entertain ourselves. However, the tradition of radio has long gone. Radio has had its highs and lows throughout the past century, but our culture and technology will be much different had it not existed. We owe our thanks to Frank Conrad and Westinghouse Electric Company, who established the first radio station, KDKA, leading America into a world of entertainment and setting the stage for television and internet. This is KDKA of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company in East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We'd appreciate it if anyone hearing this broadcast would communicate with us as we are very anxious to know how far the broadcast is reaching and how it is being received.